Hello and welcome everyone to electionspeakers.com, the place for unique critique of the important speakers of this 2012 presidential campaign. My name is Dr. Dennis Becker, and I'll be your host for these special podcasts which are designed to give voters valuable, valuable information needed to make a confident decision on November 6th. We'll be watching and listening to the candidates and others who are trying to win your vote. Their talking techniques and their talking tactics are our exclusive topics for this unique critique. And joining me today on the program, left to right around your radio dial, is senior coaching partner Monica Murphy. Monica, welcome. Glad to be here, Dennis. In addition to that, senior coach Robin Maxfield is with us. Robin. Good evening, everyone. So tonight we're going to be talking about the two speakers who were featured on the second night of the Democratic National Con- uh, Convention. This is November, This is the 5th of September. And we'll be listening particularly for comments regarding Elizabeth Warren and, of course, President Bill Clinton. So before we get to that, you know on this program we do give scores. We are not only evaluating and critiquing, but we actually score the speakers, trying our best to be objective, you know, not to be a Republican or Democrat. We're trying to critique only the speaking process. We are not focusing on the content. So in order to do that, we have a scorecard. So, Monica, would you just run over for our listeners quickly what the scorecard is all about? Sure, Dennis, I'd be happy to. Well, we've developed a scorecard that has 10 dynamic areas, and the total, the highest score for each area is a 10. So a perfect score would be a 100, which obviously as speech coaches we don't give out lightly. But 100 would be a perfect score, and the areas that we cover, I won't go through all of them, but um, touch certain areas including the eye contact the speaker uses, the vocal variety, the speed in which they deliver their message, and their ability to connect with listeners. So those are just some of the areas that we take a look at here on the scorecard. And again, a perfect total would be 100. Now, for those of you who are followers of electionspeakers.com, you know that uh, all the way back in the 08 elections, we started doing this. We're certainly going to be doing it this year again. We will cover the debates live, and not only will we use these particular scorecards, but many of you will be joining us live in the studio. We'll give you more debate, more debate information about that as we as we get closer to those dates in October. At that time, you're going to re- be receiving, as a, a member of the audience there, you'll be receiving these scorecards. We'll ask you to do the scoring as well and be a live part of the podcast. That's coming up in October. We'll let you know all about that. Now, for tonight, let's Let's start with Elizabeth Warren now. Robin Maxfield, let's talk a little bit about Elizabeth Warren. She, of course, is running for the Senate in Massachusetts, and they gave her prime time tonight uh, between 10 and 11 o'clock. How did she do, Robin, in your view? Well, overall, I gave Elizabeth a score of 71% where I felt uh, she could do better. The first thing that really struck me was the fact that her glasses uh, cut her eyes in half, which really affected eye contact. Uh, I, they weren't that way the whole time, but it was pretty dramatic because they were cutting right aqua- across the pupils. I felt that she could use a little more vocal variety, more facial expressions, and certainly more gestures. She really seemed to, a lot like Mitt Romney, what we said to him, like her arms were pinned down to her side. And maybe that was just uh, because she's not used to this and hasn't done this as much, but more animation would be better. Mm. Monica Murphy, how about you? How did Elizabeth Warren do? Well, overall, Dennis, I gave her a score of 68 out of a possible 100. The highest area I scored her on were things related to her uh, speech clarity. She was certainly very articulate, and the way she connected with listeners. She has a different style. It's a slower-growing approach. I feel like she wound the crowd up slowly. She certainly missed an opportunity, though, uh, I think, to reinforce some of the points she made with uh, a, a, a technique that we use called color words. In other words, reinforcing color words. So that means, as, as we talk about it from a teaching technique as a coach, it's putting emphasis on a certain word in a sentence so that not everything is even and it sounds gray, but actually things pop out. So, for example... Um, her sentence that said, that's what we do as a family, putting emphasis on particular words, whether it's that's what we do as a family, that's what we do as a family, 
techniques like that make things pop out a little more. And I think she did miss some of those opportunities, Dennis. See, that's an interesting point. I mean, part of, one of the main reasons we do these podcasts is to help you, the listeners, understand the techniques that these speakers are mm-hmm. using and the use of, as Monica Murphy was saying, the use of color words, words that, you know, otherwise you will understand in a black and white way. But when you colorize them, they change the meaning of the sentence. Absolutely. So as Monica's pointing out, this is probably an area, and I would agree with you, Monica, this is an area where Elizabeth Warren could have done more mm-hmm. with her speaking skill. And the value to to uh, listeners for a speakers using color words is that the speaker helps the listener understand more clearly what precisely they mean, which area of emphasis. When you talk about we could do more, is it the we, is it the do, is mm-hmm. it the more part? And listeners, listen for those color words because they will tell you whether or not the speaker is emphasizing the kinds of things that you, as the voter, see as important. So I would agree with you about that with, uh, with Elizabeth Warren. I also felt that uh, she, had, uh, she had some very aggressive words. Mm-hmm. If we try to match the words and the sound, the words were very aggressive. Whoever wrote the speech you know, did a good job writing it, but her delivery was not very aggressive. And aggressive is a strong word. Perhaps I should say it was not as strong as the words. Mm-hmm. I thought she could have matched the sound of the delivery mm-hmm. to the style, the strength of the words that she had. It often feels like a disconnect. It it's does. In synchronicity, yeah. Well, yeah. and to the point of disconnect, and, and I know we were all talking about it, there's a certain level of call and response with the crowd, and that was another potential missed opportunity in terms of letting the crowd cheer. I think maybe you were going to comment on that, Dennis, but the, I, I noticed that she would cut them off as their momentum would start, and it's such mm-hmm. a missed opportunity. Yeah, there are a lot of speakers who do that. That it's, and I've seen that in both Republican and Democrats so far. These are folks who say something really exciting, meaningful, powerful, and the the, the audience responds to it. They cheer, and then be, while the audience is cheering, they just start the next thought. They just sort of step on the opportunity to allow the listeners to absorb, to enjoy, to reward that thought. She did that a lot, unfortunately. She Although was there was a time crunch, it. too. I mean, uh, yeah, Eastern there, Standard Time, we were true. about 14, 18 minutes over. So um, maybe it's she true. felt that pressure. I don't know. And I know. think for every speaker, both Republican and Democrat, Monica, you make a good point. I mean, all of these conventions are so scripted and mm-hmm. so tightly. You know, look what happened when, when, when uh, last week when Clint Eastwood went over. They gave him three minutes. He went 12. They must mm-hmm. have been going ballistic in the back wondering Mm -hmm. what the heck are we going to do everything's overtime but uh, this is something that a lot of speakers do they just because i think this crunch time and and robin maxfield i want to ask you about this because you're our storytelling coach at the speech improvement company i want to ask you about this when you are telling a story like many of them are how how does a speaker when does a speaker know when to stop to pause to allow the listener to sort of get involved and feel the passion of the story how do they do that we're saying she didn't do it, so how could she? What should she do? Uh, so when you're telling the story, it it's it needs to be as natural. It's as if the story, if they're telling the story as if it's happening in real time, then the pauses and where the pacing would come in would be a natural place so that the listener can feel that wave of emotion. Mm-hmm. 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 Well, what was interesting when, when she was quoting Kennedy, and, you know, she said, he said... We never lost belief. In, uh, yeah, but the thing was, she did the quote, but then, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of speakers do this. She said, he said, and then she said it, and then she never unquoted it, or end quoted it, rather. You can't mm-hmm. ever unquote something, you end quote something. So it was quote, blah, 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 blah. There should have been an end quote. And she went directly from his words mm-hmm. into her words, mm-hmm. and I, that was just a lost opportunity to use the words as emphasis. Well, mm-hmm. and even if she would have been uncomfortable saying quote or end quote, you know, one of the other techniques we talk about is just using your body as a prop, yes. you know, right. and placing mm-hmm. yourself perhaps facing a little to the left when she was saying yeah. what Kennedy said, then turning back to, this, to the group. I mean, there's certainly mm-hmm. some other opportunities for that. But the, but the content of it, the in, she, she really put in something that had the potential and really did move people, certainly tying in, in and Ted Kennedy. needed to move her body more. So yeah. every opportunity should have yeah. been taken for I that. I think right. she did a great job at the opening to begin with. That As she began, she was good. She was friendly. She, mm-hmm. Her opening was very inviting. It just didn't work from there. And the, the last point that I'll make about it was the Bible quote that she made, the Matthew Bible mm-hmm. quote. I mean, when you're going to quote the Bible, talk about quoting Kennedy. What about quoting the Bible? Mm-hmm. Slow down. Let it happen. Let folks feel it. 
there was just a pacing issue about hers. As much as the, the sort of the appearance and the sense of confidence was there, the pacing and all of that just didn't work. So. I wouldn't be surprised if someone whispered in her ear 30 seconds before she went on, we're running over, watch yeah, your time. Something be. that made that a little off because I've seen her before and I've seen her be a little bit more dynamic, a little bit more animated. Not that that's so much her regular style. Mm. But I, I have seen her enjoy a little bit more liberty than I think we saw tonight. Yeah, we got to remember with all of these speakers, you know, that it's just this is a huge, huge stage. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people or so in the auditorium, millions and millions watching. On. So it's a huge stage, and they're nervous regardless of what they're doing back home. This is a big difference from when they got, like you said, Monica, they've got that pressure of, okay, folks, let's speak it up out there. It's tough. Mm -hmm. Now, but to contrast that with Bill Clinton, all right, mm. here comes along. The sort of godfather of the Democratic Party. A lot was expected of him. Mm -hmm. How did he do? Monica Murphy, how did he do? What was his score? How did he do? Wow. Well, I gave him a 91 out of a possible 100. There were several areas where I actually gave him a 10, which as a coach, I don't give out wow. often. Mm. But I thought his connection with listeners was outstanding. And I also think one of the things he does so well is that he he's just a master of using the technique we call pause for effect. He he's just a master of pausing the way he would he would pause between saying things that would allow us to really feel the impact of what he was saying. So, you know, for example, he'd say, "I want to nominate a man who mm. is cool on the outside." Pause, pause for crazy mm -hmm. applause. Mm -hmm but who burns for America on the inside. Mm -hmm. Pause. Yeah. Very, very effective. I mean, though the talk was, I think, 48 minutes and it, it was long, I do think his pausing was in effective, very, very effective. I'd even been longer than that. I don't know. It was at least 48. It might yeah, have been around 53 like or something longer. like that. Mm -hmm. All right, Robin, Robin Maxfield, how did he do? What was your score? Uh, I gave him 88%, and I felt... I, the lowest score I gave for him was the voice, the speech clarity. Just his voice was a bit rough and cracked a bit. Uh, however, um, I also agree with you, Monica. His pausing was amazing. I felt the most powerful tool in his arsenal is his use of humor. Mm -hmm. I think it cuts right through. You, it unites everyone. It bonds everyone. It makes a point in a way that is just so effective. And the way he used it tonight when he... Uh, refuted some of the points the Republicans had. He pushed away from the podium. He, his body was at an angle. He just used great pausing. His facial expression, he used everything he had. It was just so effective. He's really a master. You know, you it. mentioned about his voice, and I want to make a comment about that because if you notice, there were several places, it's particularly in the middle and near the end, where <clears throat> he kind of cleared his voice. <clears throat> you know, it sort of cracked a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that, I mean, there are probably physical reasons that we don't need to get into, but from a speaking perspective, this is a guy who for whatever, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, however long it was, he basically shouted. Now, a mm -hmm. lot of speakers do it. You know, and I, it's, it's just a silly thing to do when you're in a big convention over with a huge microphone in front of you that picks up everything. But he shouted. Now, they do it because they're rousing the crowd and all of that. I get all of that. But this is a guy whose voice, because he spoke for so long and, and was shouting for so much of it, his voice began to feel it. I would bet that backstage his voice was practically gone after this because it's a really difficult thing to do. It's a strain on the vocal mechanism. But I want to make one other point about him. And that's about the speech. He has, did, he had, and he uses, he doesn't always have, but he used this kind of slang, mm. you know, saying something. I'm fixing to tell you. I'm fixing to tell you. Right, Folks. right. I'm fixing to tell you. It's a very folksy kind of a sound. Well, it obviously worked with this group. The one thing that I was concerned about was the length of this speech and the specifics of this speech. Now, I, I have both sides of this, I'm afraid. On the good side, it's nice to hear somebody giving specifics. <laughs> who are actually saying specifically what they believe would, could, should be done, or whatever. However, the specifics of his speech began to happen, most of all, at approximately 5 minutes past 11 o'clock at night. 
It was late at mm-hmm. night. This was a long speech for this hour of the night. It was a, you know, he was arousing for the crowd, but it was long. And to begin to get into specifics at that hour seemed to me like poor judgment in terms of whatever the speech writers, the those who were running the speech or whatever. I don't know. I think you can. I think you can get away with it when you're Bill Clinton. Uh-huh. I mean, I really do. And to that point, I would say if I were to describe him taking a look at it from a style perspective. I mean, the crowd was so energized and waiting for him, but think about the style in the way he spoke. That is, if you were going to describe him to people who didn't know him, he came across, I think, as very polished, very professional, but also very parental and talking about the pride that he had. And that really mattered to the listeners. I think he had to go there. He had to say, I'm proud of Hillary. I'm proud of of Obama. I'm proud of, of Biden. And even when he got towards the end of this of the talk, when he was saying, now, I want you to listen. Here's what really happened. you know. Yeah. And I hope you remember my voice. And yeah. I want you to remember. Really playing on it with a very authoritative, parental, you can trust me type of style. Yeah, and I know, know style is something we focus on so much yeah, as coaches. I want to pick up on that while you're right there at that point. Because voice, at the end of the speech, he, he pointed his finger and he lowered his voice and said, don't you ever forget... Remember that? Mm-hmm. And he yeah, pointed, it was very, very look, it effective. Was, talk about parental and so forth, but don't. And he pointed that, and he paused and let it happen. They, you could hear a pin drop. He was, he was, he was, and very good technique. Blazoning that point into yeah. people's brains. Well, he has a level of credibility with those listeners, so it is also a specific audience of listeners. But I think his call and response with them also was very, very good. Yeah. He let the crowd really give the response for each line he delivered. So, yes, I think he was doing a fair amount of loud talking, but he was so effective with short sentence, long sentence, you know, raise his volume, lower his volume. He's just a master of that. Just yeah, a master of that. too many gestures, that. if I can put that in at the last breath before we end here. No. Just too many, yeah, it was band leading. He could have given no. a few to Elizabeth. When he talked, what? He could have given a few to Elizabeth. No, I, <laughs> I think his, his <laughs> gestures Elizabeth. were fantastic. Yeah, yeah. We needed them at this well, hour. Yeah, okay, but... But he did what we call band leading. When he was talking, he was gesturing. When he stopped talking, he wasn't gesturing. Well, it was part of his effect. And it's part of his style. I get it. To me, there were just a little bit too many for for the whole thing. But I get it. Overall, you guys gave him pretty good scores. Yeah. And uh, Mm it would be interesting to see what kind of response we get from our listeners' Facebook and tweets. We get all of them. You're all invited to do it. Send it to us. This, of course, this whole program and all the programs are up on our website. But at the moment, that's all we have time for. So we want to say thank you for listening. And uh, this edition of electionspeakers.com is over for now, but we'll be back with more of the most unique critique of the most important speakers in this 2012 presidential campaign tomorrow. We'll be back again tomorrow for this. We'll be tomorrow's big night. We're talking about uh, Mr. Obama. Let's see how he does. We'll compare him and, and Romney. But for tonight, thanks a lot to our senior coaching partner, Monica Murphy, for being here and our senior mm-hmm. coach and storytelling coach, Robin Maxfield for being here. And until next time, this is Dr. Dennis Becker saying thanks for listening and bye for now. now.